Hello, ladies on Zoom. We're moving a little slow. We heard there's a lot of traffic getting into La Jolla today. Um, but I'll kind of start us out, and I do have a little bit of a review, so we'll start. But yes, let's do announcements first. So um, today is our last day of class for this year. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate the boo. Um, we are finishing Joshua today, which is very exciting. And then we will, in January, we'll begin Judges, so January 11th. Um, I just want to throw out to you ladies that, you know, a lot of people make New Year's resolutions. Um, and I always see January as a time where people sort of recommit themselves to things. So it's a great time to think about if there's anyone the Holy Spirit is nudging you to invite to come be part of this class. Because... Uh, people just sort of renew things in January. Um, and starting a new book is a really easy time to jump in as well. And our first day in January, I will do probably a whole review, a, you know, short, but a whole review of the Pentateuch, like the whole story, where are we in the story? We'll go through the book of Judges, how did we get there? So someone who's not even had any Bible knowledge or experience can always jump in with us. Um, all right, so... The two, Christmas break, the two Christmas service projects we're kind of sponsoring here or promoting here are our Christmas jammies. Is this Friday, actually. So you're welcome to sponsor jammies. So we're sponsoring new jammies for all the kids who are staying at Father Joe's this holiday season, which we found out is 150 kids. In previous years, we've usually had about 60 or 70. Isn't that crazy? 150 this year. So we are sponsoring jammies. We're collecting books. We've had actually a ton of books donated. And a lot of people have been donating financially. So I'm not worried about us hitting that mark at all. But if you would like to be part of that project, we're still accepting checks for that. And it's uh, jammies are about $15 each. And so, you know, increments of 15 are great. And then Sally is sponsoring um, bikes for our military kids. And those are about $100 a bike. And so I will collect checks for either of those. Just put it in the memo line, either Mom Life Jammies or um, Military Bikes, and then it gets to the right place. But you can make checks out to La Jolla Press, so it will be tax deductible. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so our Christmas offerings, I wanted to go over that as well. So, yeah, next Wednesday we have a Christmas pageant here at the church. It's 5 o'clock. It's with our bigger kids, which is kind of fun. Um, Kathy Fate handpicked the kids. I was kind of like, why didn't my 10-year-old get invited? And then I was told, because my Stella is very into anything theatrical. And then I was told, oh, no, it was just high school and middle kids, that middle school kids that she chose. And so I'm sure it's going to be great because it's these bigger kids who are doing it. Um, so it's about a 20 to 30-minute production here in the sanctuary, and that is 100% free. And then here afterwards in the fellowship hall, they're going to have pizza and like an Advent fair, like crafts for the kids to do. So it's a great place to bring kids, grandkids, also neighbors. Like this is an awesome outreach, ladies, that you could invite neighbors with kids to. Um, so it's next Wednesday. So um, you, do, you don't have to RSVP for the um, church part, but if, they're, if you're going to bring anyone here, we do need RSVPs. Um, I think it's, and it's a very small, I think it's $5 a person um, to cover pizza costs and craft costs. So um, all of that you can sign up for online. I did send a link yesterday, so if you didn't get that, let me know. Um, so that's going to be really fun. We'll be part of that. And then Christmas Day, we have um, actually five services this year, which is crazy. We're adding a fifth. Um, this year, our youth ministry department is um, doing um, something brand new, and it's called Jingle Jam. So Jingle Jam is going to be at 2 o'clock, and it's going to be here in the Fellowship Hall, and it's going to be more like a party, to be honest. Like, there's going to be skits. There's probably going to be loud music. It's going to be, it's really geared towards families with younger kids. And um, there'll be a um, gift as all the kids leave. So I'm going to be definitely coming with my kids and we'll be helping out a little bit. So it's especially great for when you have kids or the grandkids that are in the very wiggly stage. Um, this is great. Or for families that, you know, church seems something a little bit foreign and new and that seems um, you know, they wouldn't just go sit in a sanctuary. So this is, you're inviting them to a Christmas party, essentially. Jingle jam. We've even been joking at the church. It's jingle jam. It's not Jesus jam. Like, <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. I'm sure it's going to be amazing because our youth ministry team is amazing. Um, so that's at 2 o'clock here. And then at 5 o'clock, there'll be, then everything transfers over to the sanctuary. So at 5 o'clock, there'll be a contemporary um, family service as well. 
more traditional in the sense it's actual um, more of a worship service. And I'm very excited because I'm pretty positive that um, our um, Katrina is going to be singing at it. So I know. I'm very excited. So I had a little chat with her yesterday. So I know. I miss her terribly. She's also, this is forward looking, but she's also going to be um, singing at our Women's Worship Night on February 4th. So I'd love for you ladies to put that on your calendars too. Um, so 5 o'clock contemporary service, and then it's going to be 7 and 9 traditional services with the big choir, also in the sanctuary. And then at 11 o'clock, there'll be a smaller service. Um, Jim Cedric runs it. It's a sweet, it's a beautiful service where they go from 11 to 12, and so they end Christmas morning. Um, if any of you have, like, much older kids, like high school, college, I think it would be fun to stay up late and do that. And then that's a really fun, small, very... Um, beautiful service. They take communion at it. It's really sweet. So that's all the plethora of our offerings for uh, Christmas Eve. Also, Christmas is on a Sunday this year, and so which is funny. So Pastor Paul will be doing a small um, 10 a.m. service in the sanctuary on Christmas Day. It's going to be very stripped down. Um, his daughter Morgan is going to be leading um, worship for it on guitar, and then he'll be doing a short message. So, um, so. You can come to church on Christmas, too. We have it all for you. <laughs> so, okay, those are our announcements. Any questions about all um, those happenings? Did you announce the concert? Oh, I didn't. Yeah, the con- Thank you. Thank you. So the concert is this Sunday. Um, big choir, big brass. Oh, my gosh, all the fun. We're going slow. Don't worry, ladies. We heard there's lots of traffic. We're, we're talking all about the Christmas offerings. Um, so, great. So, yes, thank you. And that's at 4 and 7. Oh, my gosh, that's going to be amazing. I'm still so sad they have not restarted kids' choirs because the kids' choirs used to say, sing in it. They're working on that. My, my son Axel sang in it one year, and it was, oh, it was the best when he sang. It was so cute. I did announce that. Announce that. Yep. Yep. So we, we've announced that, our Christmas Day, uh, Christmas Eve offerings, Christmas Day. Um, and then forward looking into January, we'll restart Bible study on January 11th, Women's Worship Night on February 4th. So, oh, one more after no, this is our last one. Yeah. <gasps> okay, let's start. Um, so let me pray for us, ladies. <laughs> Father, thank you for this time that we have in your word. Thank you for, um, thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you even for traffic, even though it annoys us, that causes us to slow down and to, uh, to trust in you. So I pray, Father, that you will um, open our hearts and minds to you right now. We can understand your word, know your word. I pray that you pour out your spirit on us, that we will have your deep sense of peace richly dwelling in us. I pray that you will draw us into all wisdom of what is true and help us to know you better through studying this. And I pray that you help me to teach only what is true. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, so we will be doing Joshua 23 and 24 today, finishing Joshua, which is very exciting. You can turn your Bibles there as we will be going through those too. But um, so we're going to be going through Joshua's farewell speech and a moment of covenant renewal. So before we get there, though, I thought I would just pause and do some review with you ladies. And as we are now almost through Joshua, and I wanted to, I was hoping you ladies could give me some answers and kind of talk through it a little bit. But so I would love to hear from you. I'm putting you on the spot in the moment. But what, what ladies have you learned and I have some ideas we'll go through, but if there's anything that kind of stands out to you right away of anything you have learned from studying this book, Joshua. Go ahead. Well said. The land belongs to God, but it's purposed for different people at various times. Awesome. Good. Any other thoughts strike stand out right away? Joni. everyone in the country. That's so great. So Joshua, 100% follow the Lord. He listened, he obeyed, and he was an example to everyone else. Wonderful. Um, 
Yes. we've talked about forever. <laughs> That's as we saw God begin to fulfill his three Ps. At least two of them are fulfilled. Pro, um, place and progeny. We see now the Israelites are this large group of people, not just this one Abraham, you know, and that they have actually have realized the place, this promise that God made them. But only one is that's not fulfilled at this point is a sense of this ongoing promise that somehow the entire world is going to be blessed through an offspring of Abraham. And that we, all, we know is only fulfilled in Jesus. Okay, I have some thoughts that we can walk through with it. So, um, so let me ask you, ladies, what was, what have we learned? What was God's goal in the conquest? What was God's goal? Prepare the land. And how so? What did he have to do? He had to clear the space. Exactly. Um, clear Canaan so that God's identity can dwell there in that space. What else did we learn? What was God's goal in the conquest? What did he want to create? Yes, he wanted them to know that he could trust, they could trust him, that he was fulfilling his covenant that he had made with Abraham and the Israelites. Perfect, exactly. I think the only thing I'll add is that it's a set-apart space, right? The goal is for God to reveal his, himself to the entire world. It's not just about the Israelites. Now, was, this is one question we've gone over a lot, was the point to kill all the Canaanites? No, that was not the point. What were we trying to clear from the space? Clear their identity exactly their idolatry clear their identity from the space their practices their idolatry so that god can dwell there in his holiness now do you remember ladies uh, what is the english phrase used most often to describe what god wants to do to the canaanites do you remember not to kill them but to not to destroy but to Drive them out. Exactly. The, the most often, the most common phrase used about what God wants to do to the Canaanites is to drive them out, to push them out. So um, we talked about um, there is a Hebrew word that's used to describe God's actions for those who don't leave. Anybody remember, this is trivia here, anyone remember that Hebrew word that is very debated in its meaning? It's the Hebrew word harem. So harem, that God wants to harem those who don't leave. And harem is often translated as totally destroy. But the, so those who don't leave Cain and Yahweh will totally destroy. But Professor Walton, who I've referenced a lot during the study, he translates it as to remove something from human use. The idea was to remove something from human use. So the cities, the people, the animals who are harem were not to be used by the Israelites. Um, now, ladies, do you remember how many cities in Canaan are totally destroyed? Do you ladies remember? Three. Good job. It was, well, I know, all the threes. We like threes. Uh, Jericho, Ai, and Hazor are the only that are fully destroyed. Now, how many cities is everything destroyed in? Absolutely everything. One. One. Jericho. It's the only city that everything is absolutely destroyed. And that people often say, as Deb had brought up, that this is a sense of the first fruits of the land. The first fruits is a full sacrifice to the Lord. In all the other cities, the people are harem, but the animals and the possessions are given to the Israelites to, for their use. Now, um, why are the people harem? Why are the people removed from use? What does Yahweh not want them to do? What was that? Say that again. Right, to taint, to corrode, to corrupt the Israelites. Exactly. So these Canaanites need to be harem, need to be destroyed because we don't want them to corrupt the Israelites and lead them into their style of worship. Now, in the ancient Near Eastern mindset, why was war sometimes necessary? What did it prove? God God. Your God is bigger than their God. Exactly. So that Yahweh is bigger, stronger, superior to any other ancient Near Eastern God that was worshipped. Um, now, what do we learn about the character of God through the conquest? We've talked about it a little bit. What's, what do we learn about his character? He's faithful. Faithful to keep his covenant. True. What else do we learn about him in comparison to other gods? The most powerful, the one true God. No other God can stand against him. Um, 
Now, what do we learn about, you brought this up, Nancy. What do we learn about who owns Canaan? Who owns it? God. God, exactly. So um, do the Israelites, therefore, have an inherent right to Canaan? No, because it's owned by God. So they do not have an inherent right to it. What is Canaan to them? It is a, it's a gift. Exactly. So another thing we've gone over many, a, a little bit is um, were the Canaanites really bad and were the Israelites really good? No. Good. What were, they're both bad. What was different about the Israelites? Chosen to be in covenant with him. So they are the ones who have willingly entered into a covenant with God and have said, yes, we will agree to worship you alone. We will be excited about the inheritance you are offering to us. So it was a a purposeful covenant. So now the Israelites are called holy, ladies. What does holy mean? It means Set set apart. Good. So that's one thing that I actually realized through the study that I really was like a light bulb moment to me. Things places people are designated as holy. They don't earn a holy status. So the Israelites were holy because they were set apart to reveal God's plans and his purposes. So we who follow Jesus are also designated as holy. Does that mean that we are perfect and sinless? No, exactly. We, so the Israelites were set apart They were holy as a status that was designated on them. The same with us today. We who follow Jesus are both holy and sinful at the same time. And that's something that's different because often holiness is taught as something that you attain, that you work towards, a perfection you can achieve. You never can. The idea is that we are holy and sinful. That in our sinful state, we are holy and set apart to showcase who God is and his character. A character of grace, a character of goodness, a promise-keeping, covenant-fulfilling God. So, and we, we want to showcase God's plans and purposes. We are Christ's ambassadors in our sinful state, right? And that was a great, like, oh, that was a light bulb moment to me to be like, oh, I can be a sinner and holy at the same time. Because holy is a designated status of God's role for me, not my, uh, not something I earn. So um, remember, ladies, I like this. Uh, what was Joshua's commission? He was to do what? He was to go and take the land. Yes. Okay. What is Jesus's commission to us? It's to go and Make disciples of all nations. Exactly. So we are set apart for this great commission. The Israelites were set apart to showcase God's character in Canaan. We are set apart for the great commission of extending God's kingdom one person at a time. So um, we are sinners and we are set apart. So the Israelites also, I like this too, we're supposed to notice sin and make amends through it for it through sacrifices. The sacrifice didn't take away the sin. It was noticing it, and it was a sense of cleansing the space for Yahweh to dwell there. Then they moved on. It wasn't like they continually labored over all the sin they'd ever done. It was sacrifice, move on. Same is true for us today. Jesus wants to notice our sin, to confess it, and to move on. And that he made amends for all of our sin once for all on the cross. All right, so that was a little recap. A lot of things that I've learned through studying Joshua. Um, I'm not going to go over the, full, the historical context of Joshua today. I think we have done that a lot. So I do want to, I'd like to dive into Joshua 23 and 24. Um, so ladies, when we begin this study, we are at the end of Joshua's life. Now, what will he do before he dies? In what state will he leave the Israelites? Imagine this man, he feels the weight of responsibility. These people have been led by Moses. They have been led by Joshua. But God is not going to designate one single leader for them. So what are his parting words to his people that he has cared for, that he has led? What is the legacy he wants to leave for them? So both Joshua 23 and 24 have speeches given by Joshua 
some critical scholars think that they are versions of the same speech written by two different authors, but we notice some very different things about them. So actually, just to begin, um, oh, in Joshua 23, let's read verses 1 and 2 and set our context. Joshua 23, after a long time had passed and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, Joshua, by then a very old man, summoned all Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and said to them, I am very old. Okay, we will go on from there in just a minute. (laughs) Okay, but notice, um, what do we learn about Joshua from this? He is very old. old. (laughs) He's not just old. He's very old at this point. Now, what do we learn about the land? What does it say about the land? The land has rest from its enemies. The major kings are defeated, as we've talked about. Now, verse 2, who does Joshua assemble here? What does it say? It says the elders, leaders, judges, officials. So this is just the leadership of Israel that Joshua is going to give a speech to in this moment. We believe this speech occurs in Shiloh, the spiritual center of Israel at this point. Now, what's the difference with Joshua's speech in chapter 24? Turn to that for just a sec. So Joshua 24, 1, let's see what it says. 24, 1, it says, Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. All right, so who does Joshua assemble? What does it say? It says, all the tribes, everybody. And so the final speech is to the entire community of Israel in Shechem. Now, it seems that Joshua 23 is directed at the elders, the judges, the leaders of Israel. Joshua 24 is directed to all of Israel. So what does Joshua specifically want to say to the elders? That's where we start. What does he want to say to all the people? That's what we'll look at. Um, now, one question to answer, though, or the way I think we can kind of answer is, when did this occur? This is an interesting question. So just for that, skip over to Joshua 24, 29. Let's see. 24, 29. What does it say? It says, after these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Sarah in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gat. What did I say? Gash. It's pretty old. Um, not unreasonable. People can live that long, but very old. Um, so how old is Joshua? He's 110. Okay. Let's remember that Joshua was born as a slave in Egypt. Isn't that crazy to think about? That he left Egypt with the people at the Exodus He was chosen as one of the 12 men to go spy out the land of Canaan initially. He alone with Caleb gave the minority report saying, yes, let's go take this land. And the rest of all of their peers die in the desert. That Josh and Caleb are the only two people left from that generation. So two sessions ago, Caleb petitioned for a town for himself. Anyone, a little trivia, remember how old he says he is at that point. You want to remember? Not quite. 85. Yes, Caleb says, I am 85. So he said, and he says in this moment, he says that he was 40, this is Caleb, when he spied out the land of Canaan initially and gave that minority report with Joshua. So, and that's two years into the journey. So two years in is when they do that initial spying out. So then 38 more years, 40 years total, is the full desert journey. Then we get approximately seven years of conquest, which gets Caleb to 85 when the, when the major rulers of Canaan are defeated and there's a sense of rest. So it's a pretty safe assumption to think that Caleb and Joshua are somewhat similar in age. So I think that Joshua was, was most likely around Caleb's age, maybe 40. I don't think he would be, have been any younger than 30. So um, if, this is interesting, if they were the same age, it would now be 25 years later. So 25 years after being 85, 25 years since there has been a sense of the land distributed. We don't know that for sure. But if that would be the case, the conquest began in 1406 BC. That puts us to about 1376 BC. So 
Um, these are not, you know, we're not going to live and die on these dates, but somewhere around that is most likely what's going on. So Joshua will start with an exhortation on what to do after he leaves. Then he will follow with what happens if they don't do it. <laughs> so let's start with Joshua's hopes for the elders after his death. I'm going to read Joshua um, 23 verses 1 through 8. All right. So after a long time had passed and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, Joshua by then, a very old man, summoned all Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and said to them, I am very old. You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. Remember how I have allotted an inheritance for your tribes, all the land of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered between the Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea in the West. The Lord your God himself will push them out for your sake. He will drive them out before you and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised. Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Do not associate with those nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them, for you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. Pause there. So let's notice a few things about this passage. So verse two, we notice categories actually of leaders in Israel. We know, that, we know who elders were. These were the leaders of a town who would sit at the city gate to make decisions about things that would go on at the town. Um, we also see this category of judges mentioned. And so we will explore this category in great detail in our next book that is named after them. So just noticing that they are a category that is listed, that is part of the culture of Israel. Uh, notice verse three. See again the emphasis on who is bringing victory to Israel. Who fights for the Israelites? Yahweh. Yahweh, the Lord fought for you. So a reminder for us that battles are not fought on our own strength, ladies, that I tell my kids often that prayer is actually the only means to enact real change because does wishing for something to be different change it? No. Wishing for something, hoping for something to be different doesn't actually change the situation. And prayer, we are submitting everything to the one who actually fights battles who actually makes changes, who could actually conquer kingdoms. So we don't, we don't see that world around us, and that's what makes it a struggle. That's actually even, we should not judge the Israelites, but com- commiserate with them, because their culture of Canaanite idols was something you could see and feel and touch, and it was all around them. But the idea of relying on an invisible God to be the one who fights your battles. That is harder. But that is what we still do today. It's the exact same thing. So, okay, in verse four, notice what is the status of the nations in Canaan? What does it say? They do what? They remain. Do you see that? That there are still Canaanites living in Canaan. So 30 years potentially into the conquest, they're still there. So verse five, what will the Lord do to those who remain? What does it say? He will drive them out. Exactly. So um, Joshua's about to die. There's still some Canaanites in Israel. Joshua is reminding Israel, don't trust in your own strength to drive them out. Trust in who? Trust in Yahweh. Yahweh. So up until now, the Israelites have had Moses. Then Joshua tell them what is right to tell them how to follow Yahweh the Lord. But notice in verse six, what must they now obey? The book of the law of Moses. This is the Torah, ladies. The book of the law of Moses is the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So they used to only be able to obey Moses or Joshua, but now they won't have these central leaders in Israel. They are dismissed to their towns with their Levites distributed amongst them as guides, but no central leader, no prophet um, from the Lord. So what must they now obey? They have to obey the what? The 
the Torah, the written Torah. So historically, we also notice simply that the Israelites have the Torah at this point. That's an important thing to notice, that they do have a written form of Genesis through Deuteronomy composed by Moses at this moment. So as the Israelites then had the Torah, we now have the entirety of what? Of the of the Bible. We have the whole written Bible to tell us who God is, what his plans and purposes are, how do we know him? And in the same way, the Bible guides us as the Torah guided them. So we too are to obey it, to not turn from the right or to the left, uh, but to be fully focused on it. So ladies, how do we, how do we know God's word? We do what? We, we study it. Exactly. We study it here in class. Ooh. You come here. <laughs> you, we, we read it in church, right? We study it in church. Um, I also think it's really, really important for us to be studying it on our own, to simply be reading it. Um, I encourage you, ladies, if you don't have a, um, like a discipline of putting scripture into your life daily, I really, really encourage you, ladies, to find that way to do it. And not just reading devotions. I mean, sit down, read the scriptures. It can be 10 minutes, you know? It could be an hour, depending on your life stage. When I was on the mission field post-college, I would read my Bible for an hour every morning, and it was amazing. But I also didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> I had no children. I had no work. I was just present. So, um, but it's just... You can listen to it. That's a great idea. And even, um, even to me, I play a lot of worship music because to me, a lot of worship music is scripture to song and just filling my mind with it in a regular way. Go ahead. I love it. Listening to worship music every morning. That's super important. A scripture. Oh, listening to scripture. That's great. And you actually, there are Bible apps that will read it to you. So... Um, that you could even be driving to work and um, put on your Bible app and it will read it to you. Um, Alexa will read it to you. I didn't know. That is awesome. I, um, I got out of the habit of doing a morning devotion and all when my kids were little. And a few years ago, I read um, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer, which I still really highly recommend if none of you ladies have read it. He talks about if you're going to be like Jesus, we need to take on some of the dis disciplines of Jesus. And he gives four. I like it four. I feel like I can follow that. Um, but one of his disciplines is silence and solitude. And he says, make, find a way to put silence and solitude into your life every day. And so because of that, I started setting my alarm earlier and getting myself up earlier, and it has been powerful. But what I also love about him is he's so grace-giving. He says, you know what? He says, sometimes I get up and I'm reading my Bible. He says, and my mind is drifting, and I'm not present, and I'm thinking about other things. He goes, but you know what? I'm going to be here the same time tomorrow. And I just love that, that idea of a daily discipline. Yes, it might not always be the most powerful thing that happens to you, but that sense of we are washing ourselves with God's word on a daily basis. So I encourage you, ladies, that could be a New Year's resolution if you haven't done it. And it, can, it doesn't have to be morning, but to figure out when is a time in your day. Like I was talking to a mom who... Um, she always had to get to her kid's school 15 minutes early to get in line to be able to pick them up. Otherwise, she would never get them. It would take her forever. So she had this discipline of getting herself, parking her car 15 minutes early in line, and she would read scripture at that, for those 15 minutes. So you can find, you know, find that time that works in your schedule. I thought that was, that was a pretty good genius one. I heard when your babies are little, just write scripture and post it on the changing table. <laughs> just like... <laughs> You're always there. Yep. Um, okay. So, um, all right. So then verse seven says, do not associate with who? Who does it say? The, the nations who remain among you don't invoke the names of their gods, swear by them, bow down to them. But verse eight, what, um, what are you supposed to do to the Lord instead? What does it say? You're supposed to Hold fast. So hold fast is a Hebrew phrase. It's tid baku, meaning to cling to. So what does it mean to cling to the Lord? It's actually a word that's used in some really interesting other contexts. I wanted to read a few to you. It's used a lot. So Genesis 2.24. So I'm going to read, actually, I have these scripture in your notes because I want you to look for what do you think is the phrase cling to in these scriptures. So Genesis 2.24. 
That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. What do you think is the word cling to there? United, exactly. It's also translated sometimes as cleave in other translations. So a man leaves his father and his mother and he clings to his wife um, and they are one flesh. So how do we understand that phrase in a marital relationship? Why, what does it mean to cling to your spouse? Be devoted, mm-hmm. Not have affairs. Yes, I think it's the idea of let nothing come between you, right? That, so in the same way that this, in our context, it's saying cling to the Lord, saying cling to your spouse in the sense that nothing can come between you. Marie. Message uses the word hold tight. I love that, hold tight. Okay, I've got two more for you ladies because it's very, because they're interesting. So also, um, it's the same word used of Ruth and Naomi, which we'll be leading, reading um, in the spring. So Ruth 1.4, as they wept aloud, then Orpah kissed their mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. So what's the word there? It's clung to. So, um, so what won't Ruth do for her mother-in-law? She won't, she won't leave. She won't separate. Um, but this word is also sometimes used negatively elsewhere. In 2 Kings 3.3, 3, it says, Nevertheless, he clung to the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He did not turn away from them. So what, how is this word being used here? He's clinging to what? To, to sin, to idolatry. So um, he won't be separated from these sins. He's headed in that direction. He's clinging tight to them. Okay, so how do we better understand what Joshua means, ladies, to hold fast to the Lord? What is he, think, what is he saying? What should we do to the Lord? Depend on him. Depend on, on him entirely? Let nothing become between you and the Lord. Good. That's awesome. So how do we as Christians then cling to our relationship with Christ? What does that look like? Study the word of God, obey it. Follow the word of God. Yes. Trust that it's true. Trust that it's true. Daily, I heard. Yes. Good. Even when you don't understand, still trust. Even when you don't understand, trust. Absolutely. I had a seminary professor who would always say, when you get to things that don't make sense in scripture, it's not this or this, it's and. You figure out the and. How are they both true? Is it context? Is it um Hebrew and Greek words that need to be understood better. Like, what is going on to make it and and not either or? And I love, that has stuck with me. Um, okay, so, um, so Joshua will next tell the leaders of Israel what will happen to them if they don't cling to the Lord. So let's continue. Joshua 23, 9 through 16. The Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations. Um, to this day, no one has been able to withstand you. One of you routes a thousand because of the Lord your God fights for you, just as he promised. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. But if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you whips on your backs and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Now, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. But just as all the good things the Lord your God has promised you have come to you, so he will bring on you all the evil things he has threatened until the Lord your God has destroyed you from this good land he has given you if you violate the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, the Lord's anger will burn against you and you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. All right. So, it happens. Yeah, it does happen. <laughs> Keep reading. Um, verses 9 through 10. Yahweh is more powerful than any other nation, any other God. So um, verse 11, 
what should be the response of the people? What does it say? To love the Lord your God. It's the same thing Moses said, Deuteronomy 6, 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. It's the same thing that Jesus says. Matthew 22, 37, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. So what do you think it means to love God with your heart, your soul, and your mind? Everything you have, yes. Spend time with him. Spend time with him. Mm -hmm. To trust him. To to follow him. him. Yes. Yes. Repent daily. Oh, I like that. Good. Uh, hmm Yes. It's been no- it was noticed at this table that it has to be an intentional thing to love the Lord your God, to be very careful. Yes. It, and we, we even talked about that two weeks ago, I think, with it, um, that the intention of our hearts matter to God, right? He knows that we're going to be sinners and we're going to, you know, make mistakes, but it's the intention of a heart. Are we, are we seeking God with the path and the choices we are making? Yeah, the, the love of the Lord your God is, is to cling to him. It's almost like an image of like a life raft, you know? Like it's like what you cling to in the midst of everything. It's crazy out there. We're clinging to this. That's great. It's a great connection. Um, I think, yes, I think exactly. It's to put him first, to let him determine our path and our choices and all that we do. So verse 12, it says, one thing that might, um, that might cause the Israelites to not put Yahweh first is to do what? What does it say? It says to intermarry and a second word, associate. Two different words. So this is two things. So marry Canaanite people. We get that. Okay. Now, and associate with Canaanites. Let's talk about that too. But I, I was curious as I was preparing, what was Canaanite religion? And so I have a quote for you ladies that this is from the New World Encyclopedia. It says, so in Ugarit, the gods were called... Um, Ilhim, which is El- Elohim, same word uh, designated on Yahweh at times, or the children of El, which is interesting, a probable parallel to the biblical sons of God. The chief God, a progenitor of the universe, was El, also known as Elion, who was the father of the divinities. In the Ugaritic material, El is the consort of Asherah, who is described as the mother of 70 gods. In the Ugaritic Baal cycle, Baal, the god of storms and fertility, earns his position as the champion and ruler of the gods by defeating the tyrannical Yam, the god of the sea, and later triumphing over Mot, the god of death. After a great battle, Mot finally bows down before Baal, leaving Baal in possession of the land and undisputed region of the gods. Thus, Baal comes to replace El as the most important deity, although El himself remained theoretically supreme. In practice, temples to Baal were fairly common in Canaanite culture, and many ritual objects devoted to Astarte and Anat have also been uncovered. Even the Israelites honored Baal and the Asherim, the latter term referring to the poles, standing stones, and even trees devoted to a goddess and accompanying altars to both Baal and Yahweh. And then commentator Hubbard says that because Baal was the storm god, he became associated with fertility because rain was needed to to grow crops. So the sense that you needed rain because um, to make the land fertile. So they connected fertility and rain. So the Canaanites, therefore, their worship included fertility rites, often with sexual relations. So between the worshiper and a cult prostitute. The theory was that intercourse symbolically encouraged the gods to inseminate the land. That was the theory. Abundant fertility. Um, so worship of Baal would have felt practical. The Israelites needed rain. It was also sensual, which is something humans are prone to. So most likely the Israelites had no problem with worshiping Yahweh. The, even considering him the supreme God, the issue is syncretism. Worshiping other gods also. It was the also. Not exclusively worshiping Yahweh, which is why Joshua says to cling to Yahweh alone. The way a husband clings to his wife. 
Let nothing come between them. So ladies, we've gone over this, but what's the problem with marrying Canaanites? What would that influence the Israelites potentially to do? To, to, follow, their to follow their gods, exactly. For their, children for, for children to be raised to follow their gods. Great points, exactly. So um, Joshua also says don't associate with them. So associate is the Hebrew word um, batem, which literally means to come in, to go in, to go. So the NIV translates it as associate uh, in the idea of joining with someone in something, going in on something together. It can um, have a sexual innuendo, but it's not limited to that. It's not only that. So it's a sense of not joining in with someone who is Canaanite. It could be work, partnerships, the choices the Israelites made. I think it's the same thing that the Apostle Paul echoes in 2 Corinthians 6.14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common or what fellowship can light have with darkness? The New Living Translation reads, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? So in our current text, yoked has a sense of marrying, but it also has a sense of other partnerships as well. So What was the problem with other partnerships? Well, one interesting thing is that um, when contracts were made at this time, there were no written contracts. And so they would swear by their own gods and they would rely on other witnesses to witness that they have sworn by their God. So to enter into a partnership with a Canaanite would be they would be swearing by their God to enter into that partnership with you. So it'd be even giving license and freedom to saying that your other God is important. You actually, there might be another God, something powerful enough for you to swear by. So there's that, but I think it's also the sense of heading in the same direction together, right? We know in work situations, we're gonna have certain morals and values that are probably going to um, affect how we do business, the choices we make, And so we want to make sure that we're aligned with people who will be making those same kinds of choices, those same, having those same morals and values. I think it's the same in friendships, right? We want to have our most intimate friendships with uh, with women who are headed in that same direction with us, morally, in the way, um, the way we think, the way we, you know, the choices we make. It doesn't mean we shouldn't have lots of friends that we can encourage and love and hopefully witness to. I tend to think of like concentric circles for my friendships. I, my inner circle, which are the ones that I would say I allow to speak into my life. I'm very careful about who is in that inner circle and they're all going to be believers. And then I kind of, you know, then sort of the circles go from there. But beyond that inner circle is a sense of I'm going to be your friend, but you don't speak into my life. And hopefully I can have the opportunity to speak into yours. So that's my goal. Um, so the, okay. All right, so the sense that's given here is that there's a sense of committing adultery against Yahweh, that you want to cling to him alone and be devoted to him alone. Worshiping these other gods is a sense of adultery, of, so of not clinging to him as their first love. So uh, now verse 15, if they do that, if they do not cling to Yahweh as their first love, what will Yahweh do? He says, they say, he says he will remove them from the land. So the land does not belong to Israel. It belongs to Yahweh. Uh, the covenant of the three Ps says that you must obey me for this land to be yours. Okay, so Joshua has relayed this to the elders. Now he's going to relay it to all the people. So the goal of his next speech is to call the Israelites into monotheistic worship of the one true God. So Joshua will start with a history lesson, actually, reviewing what Yahweh has already done for them. Notice as we read um, this review that it really focuses on Yahweh's victories is what what Joshua is reviewing right now. Uh, And knowing what we do about the ancient Near East, think about why Joshua selects these particular events to review. So I'm going to read 24, 1 through 13. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. 
Joshua said to the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshiped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac and Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. When I brought your people out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. He saw what you saw with your own eyes, what I did to the Egyptians. This is now switching to Yahweh speaking. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you, and you took possession of their land. When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you, but I would not listen to Balaam. So he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, and Jebusites. But I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you. Also the two Amorite kings, you did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil, cities you did not build, and you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant." All right, so verse two, this is interesting. What do we learn about Abraham's father, Terah? What did he do? He worshiped other gods. So Terah is a descendant of Noah. Those of you who have my um, blue timeline cheat sheet, um, it is listed there. You can look for him. Um, those of you, yes, yeah, so you can check that out. Apparently, knowledge of Yahweh, though, had not been taught through the generations because Noah had experienced God. So Terah had worshiped other gods. Um, But Abe and his descendants worship Yahweh. Joshua then contrasts Yahweh with the gods of the other nations. So verse 7, what does Yahweh do to the Egyptians? He buries them in the Red Sea. Good. Verse 8, what when the Amorites fought Israel, what does Yahweh do? He gives them into your hand. Verses 9 through 10, the king of Moab fights Israel. What does Yahweh do? Verse 10, he delivers them into your hand. So verse 11, the cities of Jericho fought against Israel. What happened to Jericho? Destroyed. It fell. Then the Amorites, the Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, and Jebusites fought against Israel. What happened to them? (laughs) Delivered into your hand. So verse 12, same with the Amorite kings. And then verse 12, did Israel get these victories with their own sword and bow? Nope. So what is the point of this comparison, ladies? I'm bigger than the other gods. And I think he's posing the question to them, do you want to be on the winning team or the losing team? Because there's a very clear winning team and losing team here. So then the, the very, like, the climax of this point. So then Joshua says in verse 14, now, because of all this, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshiped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day who you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, both defeated. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Such great, memorable words, right? So Joshua's like, I'm on the winning team, guys. I don't know what you're all going to do, but I'm choosing winning team. So, but he puts it as a a question to the Israelites. Joshua knows he's about to die. He cannot keep Israel on track any longer. Uh, He cannot keep them worshiping Yahweh alone. So now Israel has to make their choice. What is going to be their answer? Joshua 24, 16 through 27. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord, our God himself, who brought us and our parents out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. 
He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. The Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. But Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant, literally cut a covenant for the people. And there at Shechem, he reaffirmed for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, the stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. Then Joshua dismissed the people and each to their own inheritance. So what do the people say? The people say, yes, we will serve God. So Josh counters, you won't be able to. Why? What are the characteristics of God in verse 19? Yahweh is two, holy and jealous. Commentator Hubbard mentioned those are characteristics of Yahweh alone. Interestingly, thinking about the ancient Near Eastern gods, all the other ancient Near Eastern gods, they are not holy. They are capricious and self-centered. Yahweh alone is the author of what is true and what is good. The other ancient Near Eastern gods were jealous in the sense that they quibbled, but they did not have a sense of exclusivity. All the ancient Near Eastern gods existed as part of a pantheon. So what does it mean that Yahweh is jealous, ladies? What is he saying? Worship him alone. It's like we see again the idea of a marriage relationship. This is that you cling to the Lord, your God. You worship him alone. He is jealous because he is the one true God and he will not tolerate worship of anything else. So the Israelites say, yes, we will worship Yahweh. Um, And so they cut this covenant, this contract. And notice in verse 25, it says Joshua makes a covenant. And then where does he write it? He says he writes it in the book of the law of God. So this would probably be a reference to Joshua, the book of Joshua itself, because the book of the law of the Lord would have been the Torah. The Torah is not completed by Moses. Anything being added to it, added to the book of the law, would be what is currently being written by Joshua or another scribe. So likely this is a sense of adding to the Torah. So uh, again, we see the Israelites are at, are at Shechem, verse 25, says, uh, this is interesting. Joshua then sets up a memorial witness of a large stone and places it, where does it say? Under the oak, the holy place of the Lord. So this is interesting because there's other references to the same spot. Genesis 12, 6. Abram, he's not Abraham yet, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moriah at Shechem. At that same time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there, uh, there to the Lord who appeared to him. This is the first place that God met Abraham. Likely this exact same spot. Because where is he? He's at the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. And then what does Yahweh promise to give him? He promises to give him the entire land right there. Now, when Jacob returns from Haran, he's got Rachel and Leah and all of his sons. As they enter Canaan, he makes them leave all their household gods they brought with them. Genesis 25, 2 through 4. So Jacob said to his household and to all who are with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. Isn't that interesting? So 
Under this great tree is where Yahweh revealed himself to Abram for the first time. Under this tree is where Jacob causes his family to swear allegiance to Yahweh alone. So this tree is a witness of history. And it makes sense that Joshua chooses this location to call his people into covenant with Yahweh. So um, we'll end with just the final words on uh, Joshua. So after these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Sarah, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Israel served the Lord throughout the life of the time of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. And, jo- and Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that Jacob bought for 100 pieces of silver for, from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. This became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. And Eleazar, son of Aaron, died, was buried at Gibeah, which had been allotted to his son Phinehas in the hill country of Ephraim. So let's talk about application for just a few minutes. Um, we started a little late, so I'm just going to go a few more minutes. Um, I want to talk about idols for a moment and our culture. So uh, why was it so easy for the Israelites to engage in their neighbor's idol worship? We kind of talked about it because there's idols. What could they do? They could, they could see them, right? They could touch them. They're very tangible to them. It was what their neighbors did. So for us today, ladies, I would love to hear from you. What do you think are the idols or the gods of our culture? What are the things that are worshipped? Not necessarily by you. It doesn't have to be self-confession. But just sort of in general in our culture, what are the things we worship? Money, social media, technology. Now, what about social media? What What are we trying to do through it? Yeah. Sure, yeah. <laughs> totally. Right, some of it can be good. The icky part, I like that too. Yeah, what else, ladies? Fitness. What was that? Celebrities or sports figures. Celebrities or sports yeah, figures. It's you. Because it's you. It's because they want to get the likes. Because it gives them some type of validation. Yes. It makes them feel good about themselves. Validation back to themselves. 100%. Mm-hmm. Power. Power. Status. Status. Good. Great. So it's interesting. This commentator I was reading, he gave a couple different, but there's two that he pointed at, which I think are all the things we've been talking about here. So... Um, he says, he quotes Martin Luther, the reformer, and said that um, Martin Luther said that anything what one relies on and trusts in is a God. Anything one relies on and trusts in is a God. So Hubbard says, the danger of polytheism today is that we may be completely committed to the lordship of Jesus Christ, but still rely on and trust in things with such a commitment and a passion that it makes them other gods. We may worship, highly value, give them offerings, spend money on them, and serve them, devote time and energy. Isn't that interesting to think about? So Hubbard cites uh, a number of gods, but the two I'm going to mention is, first, he talks about the ideology of materialism that teaches that all human needs are met by material means. Happiness and satisfaction come through financial success, possessions of material goods, and pleasure. So what's the problem with pursuing these things, ladies? What's the problem? Do they ever satisfy us? No, it's this constant hunt for more, right? That um, they might give a sense of escape from worries or fears temporarily, but I'm sure all of you know, ladies, people who are constantly pursuing the more and the next and are never satisfied, right? The next trip, the next dinner, the next purchase, the next financial success, um, but are never satisfied. So Hubbard says that all these things are part of our lives. But um, the issue is, he says, here's his quote, when career or the drive to accumulate adversely affects our relationship with spouse, children, and local church, a mental red flag should go up for us. 
So things uh, will occasionally cause us to prioritize themselves above church, above God. But is it something that's an occasional or is it an ongoing part of our lives? So um, we can stand against those things in our culture. I was thinking of how um, when Axel was seven or eight, he was on a baseball team and the um, coach set the, ba- set the time for the practice as 11 a.m. on Sundays. And so I just very kindly, politely, respectfully went to him and said, hey, you know, we're excited to be on your team. Axel will come to practice, but we will be there at 1130 because we go to church on Sunday mornings. After a day or two, I got an email saying that he'd moved practice to 1 p.m. He never said that it was my conversation. He just said, it seems to work out for the majority. I'm moving it to 1 p.m. So, um, and I was not rude. I didn't tell him, how dare you? You know, I just said, this is when my family will show up. So um, Axel had a water polo tournament this summer where it had, he had a game that started on Sunday morning. And I talked to the coach and I said, if it's not going to be a huge problem for you, I would like to come to the second game. If it is, we'll, we'll be there. I understand sometimes on these occasional tournaments. And she's like, it's fine. Come to the second game. So it was all I did was simply ask. Stella has a theater program she loves to do. But they always offer a Sunday morning class and a Sunday afternoon class. Her theater instructor knows we will never sign up for a Sunday morning class. We will only ever sign up for Sunday afternoons. And she loves to do it, so I have no problem with her doing that on the Sabbath. But the, think about the witness that my family gets to have by simply doing these things in a kind and respectful way. This is, I'm not ever rude, and I am sure that there will be tournaments where Axel will probably not go to church. These will happen occasionally, but they're not going to be the trajectory and the lifestyle that we will choose. And so we, but what I, I guess my point is we have to choose these things, and we can lovingly stand against them in our culture when we need to. And for me, at least so far, there has been no negative fallout of doing that. Um, So the second one, because I want to finish... but I think the big thing is that we tend to do these things because they're fear-based. What happens if my, my son isn't um, playing every game? Uh, is the coach going to be mad at him? Is he not going to be able to play the next game? You know, is he going to be off the team? But I don't have to trust in that. I don't, I, I don't trust in chariots and horses, right? I trust in the Lord. And if the Lord wants Axel to grow on this team, he's going to grow on this team. He's going to have favor with his coaches. The second one is, um, so the God of of, uh, okay, so God of materialism says, you need this to be happy and successful. The next one is the God of me. The God of me says, I deserve this to be, I deserve this. So Hubbard says, this God preaches narcissism, the belief that every individual can be the center of his or her own world. It's the longing to be important, to put yourself out there on social media, to have all the likes, to have people think that you're valuable, to have an influence. It's the way we choose our clothes, our cars, the clubs we belong to, where we live. All of these things are us trying to have a sense of me being the most important, the self-importance. Now, the, the key thing here is, does our external matter to God? And it doesn't. What God cares about is not how we look, how we dress, where we live. He cares about our hearts, the internal quality. I love how 1 Peter says to ladies, it says, do not let your adornment come from your outside, but come from the unfailing beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, of who you are on the inside, that that's where true beauty lies. So, all right, I'm going to end this. So questions you ladies can talk about if you want to stay, which is great. If not, I've gone over, so you can end or you can leave. But journal or think through these questions. Which idols or gods in our culture do you struggle with personally? And then brainstorm, talk to others, journal through ways you can continue to submit that struggle to Christ, those things that are struggles. And I will close this. All right, let's finish. Let's finish Joshua. Jesus, thank you for this time that we have had reading this book. It has been powerful for me, and I'm so grateful that you've given us this opportunity to dive into it. And I pray that as we go into this amazing Christmas season, that you will help us to thoughtfully consider what the idols and the gods of our culture, how do we stand against them? How do we lovingly stand against um, 
the influence of the enemy in making those things the most important? How do we care for our neighbors and love our neighbors? How do we, as Christians, walk through this Christmas season putting you first and clinging to you, Jesus, above everything else? Help me to do that because I desperately want to and help all of us ladies. God, I pray for your protection over these women as they go from here and they'll continue to ignite their hearts to love you with all that they are. In your name we pray, amen.